Uh, I'm going to present today about the concept of patient-tailored ICP treatment thresholds instead of using universal thresholds. I have no conflict of interest for this talk. Questioning the status quo in TBI management in terms of ICP has recent origins in the BEST TRIP trial, which was a randomized trial where we compared a monitored group, ICP monitored, to a non-monitored group and found equivalent outcomes in both groups. Now, the BEST TRIP trial did not question the usefulness of ICP monitoring, but it did question the way that we interpret and use ICP data. The question is, is if there is an actual critical ICP th threshold. Certainly, higher ICP is worse and trending upward is worse, but is there a universal critical number? The guidelines would suggest that there is. They suggest that 22 is the number that we should treat. At a lower level, level three, they suggest maybe it's not so definite. The problem is, is that the data that's used to study treatment thresholds or, or toxicity thresholds has been gleaned from patients who are undergoing active ICP treatment. So they were being treated at a threshold, and then that data was used to determine the toxicity of a threshold. Now that's good medicine, but bad science. There are no natural history studies. So this strongly confounds the effects of treatment versus the effects of the intracranial pressure itself. Indeed, when you ask why is an ICP above a certain number bad, is it because ICP is bad when it's high elevated? And I think we all believe that. But it may also be that some of the toxicity of treatment plays into that. Treatments such as barbiturate coma and decompressive craniectomy have toxicities that can't be ignored. Indeed, it's a bit of both when you gather data in this manner and therefore the data isn't clear. In truth, are we studying the correlation of ICP to outcome, which would be a natural history study, or are we studying the correlation of ICP resistant to treatment to outcome, which is more likely what we're doing. The more resistant your ICP is to treatment, the worse you do. That seems to be true, but what numbers are required is not. Chambers used receiver operating curves to look at the uh, correlation between ICP and outcome. And when they did that, when they marched up, they got as high as 30 millimeters of mercury, at which point only 61% sensitivity for ICP and outcome was obtained. So even by 30, they had only 61%. The ICP cutoff for all patients was 35 millimeters of mercury, but it ranged from 22 to 36 for different CT classifications. This led them to suggest that it may be inappropriate to use a single target, as higher values may be tolerated in certain CT classifications. Now, an old study is about as close as we get to monitored non-treated ICP. This was an attempt at a randomized trial to look at two different mannitol scheduled, uh, two different mannitol treatments. The first was the way we usually do it, which was to treat based on ICP. And the other group was to not treat based on ICP, to simply give them a bolus every few hours or for neurologic worsening. But both groups were monitored, but only one group was treated based on the monitored ICP. Now, this was clearly too small a study to be sensitive to their question, but some of the data was quite interesting. When you look at the correlation between ICP and outcome, they had the baseline outcome below 25, and then their ICP could range actually as high as 50 before their outcome started to change. It wasn't until greater than 50 ICP that their survival definitely dropped. This suggests that there is a fair gray zone in terms of the actual treatment threshold because the, the, this was an example where the ICP was not always treated at a certain number. Is ICP of 22 a critical value? Is potentially toxic treatment for ICP greater than 22 justified on numbers alone? In the best trip trial, the exact ICP was not known in half the patients in the quote unquote control group. We know that both protocols had equivalent outcomes, but only one knew the exact ICP. The other was something of a guesstimate based on imaging and clinical examination. Interestingly, when you look at the incidence of clinical neuroworsening, the incidence was the same in both groups. You would certainly suspect that if you knew the number, there would be less times when the ICP became critically elevated. That was not the case. 
Perhaps we should start thinking less in terms of absolute numbers and more in terms of ranges using something of a traffic light analogy, where we have green is acceptable, red is unacceptable and needs treatment, and then yellow is somewhere in between. We could trend those so that getting more red would require work treatment and maybe getting going towards the green would be reassuring. And this would allow the use of non-invasive monitoring. And the reason that's important is because so far, non-invasive monitoring is being held to the same accuracy standard as invasive monitoring, a standard that will never be met. None, no non-invasive monitor will ever be as standard as an implanted pressure monitor. So it's very hard to get these approved. The holy grail of non-invasive ICP monitoring, however, is very valuable, but it may require a rethinking of our ICP thresholds. So what does an ICP of a certain number mean to the individual patient? Well, let's just say we have a, a patient in front of us whose ICP goes to 40. Well, clearly we're going to treat that because that's too high, but we can also look at the patient while that occurred. Did the pupils change? Did the pupillometer parameters de deteriorate? Did the GCS motor score change? Did the ICP waveform change? Those are all telling us about herniation and mechanical effects of that ICP spike. How about did the brain tissue oxygen drop when the ICP went up? That's telling us about signs of ischemia during the ICP spike. Why is that important? Because those are telling us, giving us information on the toxicity of elevated ICP, which can be very useful when considering ICP and CPP thresholds, adjusting them to the individual patient. If you look at ICP, there are several pathologies subsumed in there. We have the ischemia side, and we have the mechanical herniation side. There may be other sides that we understand less, but if you divide ICP into its major two components, we really represent the two great evils in traumatic brain injury, herniation and ischemia. Herniation being about pressure, and ischemia about delivery and consumption. Now, they're not separated, clearly. If you have increased pressure, you'll have decreased cerebral blood flow. And if you have decreased cerebral blood flow and edema, you'll have increased pressure. But it's useful to think of these to some extent for targeting purposes. When you look at the underlying pathophysiologic entities that we think are implicated in traumatic brain injury, even though we don't understand all of them that well, you can parse them and they tend to fall into one of two categories, the herniation or the ischemia category. So when you're looking at a patient in terms of precision medicine, and they have an ICP spike, we can look at what happens. And by doing that, we can come up with what pathophysiological entities might be involved and what thresholds we might need to use to target therapy. A similar condition obtains with ischemia. We can look at the influence of ICP on individual monitored parameters for the purpose of trying to determine what thresholds we might have, and what covariates might need treatment. Again, targeting treatment. We need to treat the physiology, but to do that, we need to understand the physiology. We can't just react to a number. Now, are we doing the right thing when the ICP does go up? The general treatment in the past with monitored patients has been to wait till ICP passes a critical threshold, in this case 20, and then vigorously attack it, usually with two or more agents to drive it back down. And we do so rather vigorously, often down to quite low numbers, and then we wait. We go back to this waitful watching program. In the best trip trial or other trials of suspected intracranial hypertension, you don't have the absolute number. So you tend to titrate the int suspected intracranial hypertension with scheduled treatments. It's, it's rather a tranquility approach. It's putting the patient in the zone. And that was what the control group of the best trip trial did. Now, interestingly, when you go back to that randomized trial of mannitol, the group that was treated routinely, rather than based on ICP, actually ended up with lower overall ICP for their whole course. So it's interesting this type of philosophy may be effective. Clearly, however, these suggestions suggest that it's time to rethink ICP management. A critical threshold applied to all patients at all points of their treatment is probably not optimal. It sets the ICP threshold and therefore the MAP threshold or the CPP, and we treat rather vigorously and sometimes toxically based on a number that may not be universal, universally applicable, and even more may be determinable or at least estimatable 
in individual patients by using multimodality monitoring and thinking in terms of pathophysiology and not simple numbers. Thank you very much.